Hey, I'm Felissa Rose, and you're watching Keto and Crime. What you're looking at is scenes from 1922's Nosferatu, one of the earliest film adaptations of Bram Stoker's Dracula, the infamous vampire we all know, love, and somehow hate as well as always return to. He is the backbone of the modern vampire mythology that has become so near and dear in the entertainment world from everything from twilight to true blood or had its origins here with count dracula so was there really a dracula obviously there really wasn't a bloodsucker but bram stoker based his character of dracula on two real life people and that's what we're going to learn about today in a special double episode of a keto and crime classic where we look at the two real life bases for count dracula it's going to be an interesting uh, study and i hope you enjoy it and so here is 2018 tracy telling you about the real life origins of count dracula Hey everyone, Keto Comet. Welcome back to 31 Days of Keto Ween. Today I'm coming to you from beautiful Oregon. I'm literally in the woods, so that's why I'm in my truck because I don't want to disturb the rest of the family that's in our RV. So, ah. today we're going to start number one of a two part series on the origins of Count Dracula. Now, Count Dracula originated with a novel written by the Irish writer Bram Stoker in 1897. Now, of course, a lot of it was written about Brahms' own life because he grew up literally in the heart of the Irish potato famine, so there was a lot of poverty, so a lot of the misery and gothic themes you see in that novel are the result of Bram Stoker's own life growing up. But where did he get the basis for his character of Count Dracula. Well, there are actually two main sources. Both come from the same area around the Carpathian Mountains. We're talking Hungary and we're talking Transylvania. And we're gonna look at the two characters, the real life historical figures that were, that led, to, based on Bram Stoker's own writings and his research, along with the other vampire folklore that was already out there led to these two historical figures actually becoming literally the bloodline of Count Dracula. So I thought you would enjoy this if it's right in with 31 days of keto Wayne. So let's get into it. The origins of Count Dracula. First, to better understand both of these historical figures, we need to take a look at the time and area in which they lived. Both of these lived in the 1400s and then later in the late 15 to early 1600s. So the, these very much a, dark, a time around the Dark Ages, maybe going into the Renaissance around 1600 in Europe, but they lived in extreme, extreme Eastern Europe. We're talking about they were on the buffer zone of where Europe becomes the Middle East and Asia. So this is the area we're talking about around the Carpathian Mountains that are uh, associated with present day Hungary and Romania. So around those Carpathian Mountains, particularly the area of Transylvania, which was a small city state within that area. And one of these is actually a member of the royal family, which we'll talk about of the kingdom of Wallachia, which was a city state associated with Austria-Hungary and Romania. So let's take a look. Here you see on this map the Kingdom of Hungary, Moldavia, which no longer exists in its present form. We're talking about this is where the Serbians and that area is, Bosnia, all that, all that good stuff. And here is Hungary, Moldavia. Down here you have the Ottoman Empire. Now the Ottoman Empire was a Turkish empire that rose up after the Roman Empire fell and took over a large portion of the Middle East and made their way to 
Europe. So they were right up on the cusp of Europe, and they were wanting to bring the the religion of Islam to the entire world. So they were literally backing up on Europe's doorstep. And you had this, what we call a buffer zone, which included the, the sovereign state of Wallachia, of which one of our characters was a member of the royal family. And then just behind Wallachia, you had Hungary, which is a the origins of our second person in the origins of Count Dracula. This was kind of a lawless time. You had kings deposed and risen up quite often. You had a lot of torture, a lot of prison, a lot of disease. This was truly a dark time, especially if you lived in this area because you lived, especially if you were a Christian, because this area was a mixture of Roman Catholicism here in Hungary and Moldavia. And then in here, in kind of what I call the, the buffer zone, you had Greek Orthodox Christianity. And then, of course, you had the Ottoman Empire here with is Islam. So you had a great war of religions going on in this area. This area was kind of a a buffer zone and a contact point for the overshoot of the Crusades, which were taking place during this time. So there was a lot of war, a lot of just mistrust, a lot of take but not give back kind of attitude, and all of that led up to the origins of the two people that we're about to talk about. So let's get in to part one of the origins of Count Dracula with our first historical person. All right, I'm sure you've already guessed our first person, probably the one most associated with Count Dracula, was Vlad III Dracula, or Vlad, Vlad the Impaler, as he's more commonly known. And I heard he won the Halloween yard decoration contest many, many years in a row during his lifetime. But he was born in 1428, somewhere between 1428 to 1431 in the sovereign Romanian state of Wallachia. He was the third son of Vlad II Dracula, or Dracu, Vlad II, let's just call him Dra Dra uh, Vlad II. He was his third son. He had two older brothers and one younger brother who we will talk about. But uh, the origins of Vlad's mother is kind of speculative. Many believe because Vlad II had many, many concubines, many, many lovers, many, many wives from all accounts. We don't really know who Vlad's Vlad the Impaler's mother was. So I'm sure that played into, you know, there was some mommy issues going on there. I'm sure that played into a little bit of his psychosis over the years. But uh, he was born in a very privileged way to the ruling family of, Wallach of Wallachia. <clears throat> this is before Romania was a established unified nation. So all these little city-states, you had Wallachia, you had Transylvania, you had Moldavia, and then you had Hungary. You had all of these states that were kind of sovereign on their own. And he was born to the ruling family of Wallachia in 1428 to 1431. We're just going to put it right there. Now, Vlad II, his father, was a member of the Order of the Dragon, which was a an organization created by the Greek Orthodox Church to basically keep Islam from spreading into Greek Orthodox states. So it was kind of akin to the Knights Templar, though a totally different sect. Knights Templar was more associated with Roman Catholicism, but this is more Greek Orthodox. But it was something similar. These were people that were sworn to defend uh, Greek Orthodox religion and to keep Islam out of their country. And Vlad II was a member of this. And as a result, he got his other name, Vlad Dracul, which means Vlad the Dragon. And as a result, Vlad the Impaler, Vlad III, the subject of our uh, talk here, was called Vlad Dracula, which literally translates to Son of Dragon. Vlad, the Son of Dragon. As I said before, very, very violent time uh, to be alive. You had the Ottomans bearing down with Islam on all of these uh, Christian nations. You had the 
barons and the noblemen and the kings of these nations warring with each other. You had st strife between not only Islam and Christianity, but within Christianity, you had different warring sects. You had Greek Orthodox versus Roman Catholicism versus Protestantism, because this is after you know Henry VIII and all of his shenanigans. So you had... Um, you know, you had Lutheranism, you had all this stuff kind of battling out. So people didn't really know who to trust. And it was into all of this, the young Vlad was born. Vlad's father, Vlad II, uh, was uh, actually invited by the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Mem Mehmed II, to come visit his court. Now, the reason for this being that there had been messings that the king of Hungary and Vlad II, who was king of uh, Wallachia, were going to join up to kind of help push back the Ottoman Empire. So as a result, and the Vlads had a huge, huge history of being a warlike family that had defended their little nation to many, many oppressors over the years, and Mehmet II knew this, so he invited uh, Vlad II and his two young sons, Vlad III and Radu, who we'll learn a little bit about later, to come to court to kind of talk things over. Unfortunately, they were all taken prisoner once they got there. And basically, Vlad II was pressed into swearing allegiance to Mehmed or the, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and then to keep him loyal, he was forced to leave Vlad III and Radu in the court of the Sultan as a bargaining chip, and he was allowed to go back to Wallachia, and he reasoned that if they died in the service of their country, this was okay, because he was prepared to do that, and his children should be prepared to do that, so they were kind of an okay form of collateral damage in uh, Vlad II's eyes. So Vlad II was sent back to rule in a little more pleasing way to the Sultan and to help even bring the Sultan into power there while he held his two sons hostage. While in the grasp of the uh, Ottoman Empire, it was said that both Vlad III and Radu were subjected to physical torture right up to sexual torture or sexual assault, sexual molestation, because sadly it was kind of a tradition in the Ottoman court to kind of initiate young boys and young girls into the ways of the world. Now, this is not my preferences, I'm not putting this out there saying it's okay, but I'm saying that it was done in the Ottoman court that way. And so... Vlad and Radu probably were subjected to quite a bit of shenanigans, uh, if, if you know what I'm saying. These were young boys. They were maybe eight or nine years old, so wasn't very wasn't very pleasant for them. And uh, as a result, Vlad got more obstinate. He developed a huge hate for the Ottomans and a hate for the Islamic religion, which seemed to y'all you know, tie in. I'm not saying that it was allowed in the religion, but that's the way he took it. While Radu was a little more submissive and kind of just gave up in a way and accepted his fate. And as a result, Radu kind of fell into favor with the Sultan. And actually, both boys were educated there. They were ed educated in history, uh, religion, science, astronomy, all all great things. They, they were highly educated while at the court. So that was an advantage of being there. It's just the other advantage was the disadvantage was the abuse that they suffered. Okay. So the two grew up in the uh, court of Mehmed II of the Ottoman Empire. Radu kind of assimilated while Vlad II remained a tad bit obstinate. This all happened to the boys around 1442. So for about five years, there was a tenacious peace between Wallachia and the Ottoman Empire. And then in 1447, John Hyundai, who was 
by all accounts the king of Hungary at that time, decided to invade Wallachia with the Hungarian forces and take over the throne, which he did. And in the meantime, during that war, he killed both Vlad II, Vlad the Impaler's father, and his eldest brother, Mercia, who was not only killed, but before he was killed, he was tortured in a very heinous way by impaling and having his eyes gouged out. So Vlad saw from afar what happened to his oldest brother, and John Hyundai of Hungary actually installed Vlad's cousin, Vladislav II, as interim king of, of Wallachia at that time. Well, of course, as you can imagine, Vlad wanted to take his birthright. So he actually, with an army and the blessing of the Sultan, actually rode in to Wallachia and started a war with his cousin for control of the throne. Vlad succeeded in driving out uh, Vladislav and taking over the throne. During that, this was a one month reign. During a one month reign, he managed to um, try to unify the, uh, the area by purging out Roman Catholics and Saxons, which were uh, white, basically white Anglo-Saxons from uh, more Western Europe that had come there. He started purging them out in very heinous ways, which we'll talk about. But Vladislav was able to rally with the Hungarians at this time and wage a secondary war against Vlad, again, forcing him out a month later. And then Vlad went back to uh, the Ottoman Empire, asked for help, which the Sultan gave, and came back and again waged war against his cousin for control of Wallachia, which he won, and this time killed Vladislav in battle, officially taking the throne in 1456. And then a more heinous purge of the Saxons and the Roman Catholics began because as you remember, Vlad was Greek Orthodox. Uh, even though his brother Radu had converted to Islam, he never did. He never fully embraced it. So he steadily began purging out any religion that was not his own. And this is how he got his nickname, the Impaler. Impaling is the act of killing someone by inserting their body over a wooden or metal stake in a very slow, painful method. Now, I was kind of surprised when I was doing research because I honestly thought he was killing these people and then just impaling their bodies after death is kind of a warning. But no, impaling was the actual mode of execution. Basically what would happen, they would trim down and grease up a, uh, a stake of some sort and it would be inserted into already existing orifices in, in the person that they were torturing, namely Saxons and Roman Catholics. A lot of priests were killed during this time. Uh, they were actually, they would take the stakes and insert them into either the rectum or vaginal opening of a woman they would then hoist them up, stake them into the ground, and let nature take its course. And basically what would happen, the person would begin to convulse and shake as the stake moved ever further into their body until their complete circulatory system shut down and they died. So it was a very painful, drawn-out way to die, and it was extremely messy and extremely stinky, for lack of a better word. They said that what... Wallachia actually stunk during the the second reign of Vlad the Impaler because of the amount of people that he executed in this manner. He seemed to get off on it. Uh, there were reports of him back in the Ottoman Empire torturing mice and birds in this fashion, and it just seemed to mill over into humans. A lot of people believe because he was probably sexually molested as a child that the way that using impaling as a way of murdering other people kind of gave him a way of taking back the control that had been taken from him as a child. And like I said, this is in the 1400s, so this is all just as close to historical speculation as you can possibly get, but I still think it, it warranted saying that it was probably a way of him trying to take back control. 
Uh, Vlad made a party of it. There were many times he would raid a village, a Roman Catholic village or a Saxon village, and literally impale everyone there and then sit down and have a meal watching them as they died. There is even some rumors that a servant of his during one of these uh, parties became overcome with <clears throat> sickness from the smell and began to heave. Vlad thought that was a sign of weakness, so he decided he would help the servant by getting him out of the mess and had him impaled on a stake twice as high as the other stake so that he was up in the air and the smell did not reach him. Thanks, Vlad. Appreciate that. Vlad was an equal opportunity executioner. He executed men, women, and children. If he murdered an entire family only to find a small child that had been left, he would immediately have that child killed too. Because in his opinion, children, though adorable now, will be an enemy that may try to kill you in the future. Uh, he was married twice in his life. His first wife is unknown. His second wife didn't live long because she... Uh, she lied to him, along with another concubine, lied to him about being pregnant, and when he had her examined to see if she was telling the truth, found out that she had lied to him. He had her, he had her killed as well. He also had many lovers. One of these is the woman that was rumored to have killed herself when the Turks, if you've ever seen the movie, the Francis Ford Coppola version of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, the woman that kills herself in the very beginning, that's based on one of his concubines that was said to have seen the Ottomans coming toward the end and decided that uh, she would rather give herself to the wolves than to the Ottomans and threw herself over the, the balcony. Uh, so that's all based on a concubine, not an actual wife. So all throughout his reign, he continued to purge and then Mehmed II, decided he wanted some payback for helping Vlad secure the throne of Wallachia. And he actually sent emissaries to Vlad asking for tribute, for him to pay tribute to the Ottomans. Uh, while there, it is said that his two messengers were asked by Vlad to remove their turbans. Uh, in the Turkish court, it was not a thing to do to ever remove your turban in public so they politely declined saying it was against their code to remove their turbans and Vlad um, appeased them by having them seized and having their turbans nailed to the top of their head so they could never take them off again and then sent their bodies back to the Sultan. There was a tenacious peace as you can imagine between the Sultan and um, Vlad from 1460 to 1462 until finally Mehmed had had enough and he actually sent an army into Wallachia led by uh, Vlad's younger brother Radu in 1462 to take the throne and install Radu as king which would have just have been a puppet government for the Ottomans. Uh, during this time, Vlad adopted a scorched earth policy while fighting the Ottomans. He would destroy everything in sight to prevent the Ottomans from using resources. He poisoned whales, he burnt, he killed livestock, he burned vegetation, burned crops, burned houses. Basically, when Radu was marching in, he saw nothing but destruction. It was more, it was a mental game and it was also a way of preventing them from being able to feed and water their armies. Also, he would send people inflict, infected by the plague into Ottoman camps, making lots of them sick. So it was not pleasant to fight Vlad. He was uh, a master of early biological warfare and intimidation for sure. Uh, while in battle, Vlad and his men, some of his men snuck in to the Ottoman camp and thought they saw the tent of the Sultan himself and said if we can kill the Sultan or capture the Sultan this is over. So later on when they attacked the camp they went back to that same tent however they had made a mistake it was not the Sultan's tent it was the tent of an Islamic uh, holy man so they killed him out of anger of course but uh, realized that their whole thing of capturing and ending the war in one fair swoop would not would not be done. 
it was during this time when the Ottomans were marching toward Vlad's capital in the Carpathian Mountains that Vlad decided he needed to intimidate them as much as possible, so he created an impaled forest, which was basically not only Turks that had been killed and impaled, but also his own countrymen. That From the many he had killed during his purge, he also continued to kill people during this war because everybody was collateral damage and just something to be used for sport and for his own gains. He basically created a forest of impaled bodies a hundred into the thousands that when the Ottoman army approached, of course, it got their attention and Mehmed II was actually asked to come to the head of the of the army to see what to see what they were seeing and when he saw it he said he said to have said any man that can do this is a man I can't defeat. So he was said to have pulled back at that time, that the intimidation worked. Uh, the fighting continued uh, for a while, and eventually Radu was installed as a puppet king of Wallachia. During this time, a new royal family, uh, John Hyundai, had died, so a new royal family rose to prominence in Wallachia's old enemy of Hungary. Uh, you had two families. You had the king, Marcus Corvanus, and his cousin, Stephen Bathory, who is the great-great-grandfather of the next person who was the source for uh, Count Dracula, uh, joined forces to help reinstate Vlad the Impaler as king of Wallachia. Because remember, Wallachia, Wallachia was literally the only thing standing between Hungary and the rest of Europe and the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman expansion. So they needed Vlad. They needed that crazy killer in power to protect Hungary and the rest of Europe. Because at this time, uh, Marcus Corvanus and Stephen Bathory were uh, launching what, what would become to be known as the Fourth Crusade to try to take back Jerusalem. And the Ottomans were the main source of their uh, of the fodder there so there was a lot of warring going back and forth and as the ottomans now had a puppet king in radu in wallachia they had inched ever closer to taking over europe so they needed vlad vlad had been exiled to hungary after after his defeat at the hands of his brother uh, he was put into prison there, uh, again, torturing mice and birds with his favorite uh, method of execution, impaling. And eventually he seemed to kind of step in line. He gave up Greek Orthodoxy, became a Roman Catholic, ironically, because Hungary was a Roman Catholic uh, country. He became engaged to one of Marcus Corvinus's cousins, and he let him out of prison, gave him an estate, and eventually came back to him to proposition him to with a joint Hungary and Wallachian force to go in and retake the throne of Wallachia which he did and was reinstated for his third reign sometime in 1470 and from that time there was a huge amount of war and conflict between the Ottomans the Hungarians and the Wallachians lots of battles were fought and eventually Vlad was killed in battle around January 10th, 1477. The Ottomans immediately tore his body into more than five pieces, from what I'm told, and had his head encased in honey and sent back to Mehmed's court to show that indeed the dreaded impaler and the defender of Wallachia was dead. The rest of his body was placed in an unknown place of burial. Some say a monastery that he had actually built during his third reign um, there in Wallachia. And a popular rumor says that after 10 years after his death, the priest actually opened up the tomb to look at his body and it was gone. Thus feeding in to the whole rumors that he was indeed a creature of the night and not a real person. That's the story of Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Dracula, Son of Dragon, which is where Bram Stoker, after much painstaking research, actually got the 
the family name for the famous vampire. And actually, in the 1920 revival picture starring Bella Lugosi, he actually is commented, as well as in the book, saying that he's descended from the Vlad royal family of Wallachia, which included Transylvania. So there is your namesake for Dracula. But where did Bram Stoker get the idea for all the blood drinking? Because even though Vlad was a famous impaler of men, he's only been of noted to ingested blood one time when it, it's rumored, it's rumored, it was never proven that he dipped a piece of bread in a victim's blood and ate it. We don't know, but that was not a regular occurrence with Vlad. He just killed people and that was it. So he was definitely the namesake and the brutality figure for Count Dracula. But where did they get the whole bloodlust from? With the story of Elizabeth Bathory, great, great granddaughter of Stephen Bathory, who we touched upon in our first story when he helped Vlad the Impaler, who was the namesake of Count Dracula, who became his family line. Um, achieve, uh, conquer the throne of his native Wallachia for the third and final time. So let's get into the story of his great-great-granddaughter, who they say was the source of the Count's love for blood. Elizabeth Bathory was born to the Bathory, the royal family of Hungary, the Bathories, around August of 1560. She was the daughter of the Baron George VI Bakery, who had been ruling uh, Hungary for the past 10 years. Um, she had a very privileged childhood, as you can imagine. Uh, her mother, there's not a lot documented on her mother. It seems that royal families in this Carpathian er area during this time had a lot of different wives, a lot of different concubines, a lot of stuff going on, and whether their children were born to actual spouses or to uh, basically, you know, uh, legal lovers, they were all considered equal, equal uh, heirs to the throne and things like that, so there was none of the illegitimate stuff that you see in, in other parts of European lore. So, during her childhood, she is said to have suffered from epilepsy. She It was called the falling down sickness during this time. She uh, had many, many seizures and as a result suffered some brain trauma, as you can imagine, and uh, ended up being kind of a sickly child. As a result, she developed a love for reading and education. So. She would learn her math, her science, everything else that a, uh, which was actually kind of unusual for women in this time to actually be educated. But uh, she, because she couldn't do much else because of her illness, was allowed to read and talk with her brother's tutors and things of that nature and learn a lot. Because her father saw that a young lady of her status, who would probably be used as a bargaining chip at some point for uh, political alliances should be educated, should be able to carry on a conversation, and should be admired. So he allowed her to become educated like her brothers. So she read up on everything. Uh, one thing that she really took a liking to and an interest in was the occult. Um, she read about witches and warlocks and uh, basically what would be today considered Wiccan cults to understand their rituals, and also got into what you call the dark side of that, which is uh, the power of uh, human blood. And she started uh, reading a lot about ancient occultic practices, druid practices, where blood was used in rituals to uh, do things from take power to all the way to curing illness. And they think maybe a desire to cure herself of the falling down sickness or epilepsy might have been a reason why she developed a strange affinity for blood. At the age of 10, she was uh, betrothed to Finrit Nadazdi, who was the heir to the throne of Hungary, which was pretty pretty much standard in, in that day and age. You know, women were kind of bargaining chips. Uh, they were used to there were very few actual women monarchs uh, in this area of Europe, because 
So I said, this is the same area of Europe we looked at with Vlad. It's the buffer zone between the Ottoman, expanding Ottoman Empire and Europe. So uh, most of the monarchs in this area were men. Women were mainly used to expand political power, unite families, things of that nature. So at the age of 10, she was actually betrothed to him. He was about six years her senior. But it's rumored that in addition to getting into the occult and things like that, that Elizabeth also was very sexually active for a woman of this time. She engaged in uh, sexual acts with many different partners, even as a very young teenager, and at the age of 13, was said to have gotten pregnant by a peasant boy. Well, uh, as you can imagine, this didn't sit well with her family's plans for her, so rumor has it that after she gave birth to the baby, it was taken to a woman in Transylvania and given uh, to her to raise, and the peasant boy was killed to keep him quiet about what had happened. So, kind of a bloody beginning there. Elizabeth saw the cruelty that her father put out toward enemies and how he used violence and death as a way of silencing people for his own political gain. So, in addition to her interest in the occult and interest in blood magic, she started seeing how violence and death could serve one's own purposes from her family. And then she did eventually get married to uh, Fenerix, whose family gifted her Katichus Castle, which is, a trend, which is in the Little Carpathia region, which uh, many believe was Bram Stoker's inspiration for the Castle Dracula, a very ominous place. It's still in Hungary today. Uh, at the top of the Carpathian Mountains, uh, very dark, very ominous, kind of overlooks where Hungary becomes Wallachia. So many believe it was the, the inspiration for Castle Dracula. And her husband gifted this, which had been in his mother's family for many years, to his new bride and took her home there. Uh, their wedding was a huge affair with some say guests into the thousands, where Elizabeth hosted it all night long, chatted up with her guests before retiring back to the castle with her new husband. During uh, their very brief marriage, uh, Fenrit was made commander-in-chief of the Hungarian army and went off to fight the Turks in what would be known as the Long War, 1593 to 1606. Uh, the Long War took place between the Ottomans and the Hungarians and the Wallachians. So it was basically an expansion of the Fourth Crusade where they were stop, trying to stop the uh, Islamic expansion into Europe. So her husband was away most of the time leading the army. During that time, uh, Elizabeth uh, was sort of a humanitarian by all accounts. Uh, she would take in uh, strangers and wounded. She would especially become a champion for women. She would uh, go to a uh, bat for poor women that were having trouble with the legal system. She uh, took in a woman whose husband was captured by the Turks during the war. She took care of rape victims and abuse victims. So don't think Elizabeth was all bad. She had her good sides too. Though her interest in the occult continued to grow, she continued to educate herself because over the course of their marriage, uh, they had five children and she also made sure that her daughters and sons received the same type of education she did, in which case she taught it to them in many ways. Now, it was during this time while her husband was away that King Matthias of Hungary came to Elizabeth asking for more money to keep the war going, to keep the army up, and he, she loaned him an undisclosed sum, but they said in today's, this value would have been well into the millions to continue the war. She was doing it to help her husband and to help her country. So she was very well connected with the royal family and and uh, got along really well from all accounts for that. Now, it was also during this time that people started noticing that servants were disappearing around the castle. Uh, also, uh, villagers from the nearby village were coming up missing. Um, no one really thought a whole lot about it until it started to become exponentially 
more. Uh, many suspected that they were being kidnapped by someone and there were rumors circulating that at the castle she had secret rooms where she was taking. So y'all, my wife came out here and she was like, uh, why don't you start the truck so that you have some heat? We have a seat warmer in this, so I'm nice and toasty now. But you might actually hear a little bit of background noise. I apologize for that. So let's get back to it. Uh, rumors were kind of kind of abound all across Hungary and uh, the Transylvanian area, which is near where her castle was, that um, a lot of these missing girls were being taken to her castle and actually tortured and drained of their blood because several bodies had been found where the almost all of the blood had been drained from the body. It was kind of spooky. There was definitely a serial killer or some kind of fetish killing cult going <coughs> going around in Hungary at this time, and rumors started to speculate it was the Baroness herself. Um, this was complicated uh, for her because her husband Fenric kind of kept her out of trouble. He, you know, as she was being well connected with the king, he was even more well connected with the king and kind of kept investigations at bay. A lot of people speculate that he knew about her uh, activities and even though she was genuinely did some good work, uh, she had an evil side and part of that included potentially killing and draining people of their blood in order to use the blood for various rituals. Now, one thing you have to realize, all of the, all of the, the entire case on Elizabeth Bathory is fairly circumstantial. There's not a whole lot of concrete evidence in this case. So bear that in mind, though she does have quite a reputation even with the circumstantial evidence. Uh, her husband did die January 4th, 1604 from a long illness. Some say that um, she may have put a curse on him. I seriously doubt that was the case. I don't really believe in curses, but that he suffered a very painful disease that basically crippled him in the legs. Uh, a lot of people think it was early, it was an early form of polio, if not polio itself, but he did die in 1604. During the years of 1602 to 1604, the amount of people disappearing in this area started to triple. We're well into the hundreds now. And the king, with Fenric being dead, decided maybe it was time to actually investigate Elizabeth and to see if these rumors are true. So he did send a state investigator in to kind of look, look things over. Now, remember, the King Mathis is kind of into the Bathory family for a lot of money. Now, in breaking with normal tradition, Fenric had taken Elizabeth's last name because the name of Bathory was well more, a lot more respected than his own name. So he did take uh, her last name. So he was Fenric Nasdi uh, Bathory. So the Bathories were quite a no noble family. So I think... Many speculate that King Mathis, the reason that he investigated things that were only circumstantial was the fact he was hoping that they would find that she was guilty and he wouldn't have to pay back that million, million dollar loan that he had given her. So there was some politics at play. Also, a lot of people speculate a lot of this was trumped up on her because she was a woman, a powerful woman, and by all regards, an early feminist. So... I believe the truth is somewhere in the middle. I believe she did kill some people. I believe she had a fascination with blood. The whole bathing in blood, which was the uh, the whole the whole thing of her being called the blood countess and that she would drain these women and bathe in their blood, I believe that may be blown way out of proportion. I don't know. But in any case, in 1604, this investigator was said to have caught... Elizabeth and four of her servants in the act of killing and draining a young girl. Um, of course, she was arrested as well as her four servants. Um, the trial lasted for a couple, several months over which many witnesses testified to what they had seen, though the fact that there could have been that many eyewitnesses is kind of speculative, but people speculated. They also said they found her diary, which has never been released uh, to the public to read, were a detailed account of her killing over 650 victims. 
but in any case, because she was such a high-ranked nobility, instead of executing her, they put her on house arrest in her castle where she died at, in 1614 at the age of 56, a prisoner in her own home, literally. A uh, little subscript to this story, the king did have to pay back that loan after all. So this is the woman that, because of the location of her castle and because of her reputation for blood, whether it's true or not, she was definitely, I would consider her a serial killer, but whether or not she did the types of things that she's accused of to that degree, I don't really think so. I don't know, but there's a lot of different speculation on that. Like I said, this was many, many years ago, hard to really know. But it was because of her reputation that, and the location of her castle and the fact that he went and toured her castle and saw all its abundant creepiness that Bram Stoker decided that Count Dracula should be the male incarnate of Elizabeth Bathory. And together with the name of Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Dracula, we have what we know today as Count Dracula, the most famous vampire in the world. I hope you enjoyed this. I did, and I'm going to be back soon with uh, even more. I'm going to go over the uh, Salem Witch Trials, some other stuff that I think you guys will really enjoy, as well as I'll continue on with my reactions, of course. Anyway, I hope you guys are enjoying this. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Ketosis, y'all. Keto Comic.